Hey guys, thanks for joining me tonight. Uh, excited about uh, what God's got for us. Um, now, we have been talking about, obviously, what it means to be a follower. We've been working on this week after week after week. Really, and this is about, this is practical stuff. This is this is how we live this Christian life. How do we fulfill what God's left us here to do, right? So as we're working through that, what does it mean to be a follower? We've looked at what it means to deny ourselves, how we address the issues of our flesh. And then we've also then moved on to what it means to go to our cross, right? As Jesus told them, he says, you know, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. So that's our goal. That's what we're approaching. That's what we're trying to accomplish. So as we jump into our service, into our service, into our message tonight, um, we're going to go back to, as I talked about a couple weeks ago, those that are religiously lost. Those are folks that believe they are following God, but in reality are believing a lie. That's what we're going to cover tonight. So we're going to jump into that. Let me pray for us, and then we will move right on into the service. Again, thanks for joining me. Love you guys. Let's pray. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity you've given us, Lord, to uh, be in your house, uh, Lord, virtually. But God, thank you so much for the work you've done. Uh, Lord, the scriptures that you've given us for this evening that we're going to study, that we're going to look at, and God, the, the, the mission that you've left the church Lord, that we're to reach this lost and broken world. So thank you, Lord, for calling us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us uh, the spirit of God that lives within us. Lord, thank you for opening doors of opportunity and utterance with the lost world and people that you cross paths, that we cross paths with. Thank you, Lord, for the burden you've placed on our heart for people that we care for their souls. God, I pray that tonight you will speak to our hearts. Lord, help us to have ears to hear the truth. And Lord, if no one else receives tonight, Lord, help me to hear. God, help my burden to increase. I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, that we will become a bright beacon of light in the midst of a dark, dark world. Thank you for this time. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you'll notice I had a little bit of ambiance music tonight, so we'll see how that goes. And also, obviously, I got rid of the mirror behind me, so there's not the distraction of the stormtrooper uh, that I heard plenty about from last week. Um, so I've made some changes, trying to make it a little bit easier for you guys to pay attention and to listen. Um, I've, again, thank you so much for spending this time with me. And you know what, as we were, um, last week, as I talked about, you know, we, we had a little bit of a shift. We had a little bit of a detour. And what we did was we transitioned off of talking about the religious loss, but we were still talking about the lost world. But what we tried to do last week was, and I feel like God just really wanted us to focus there. And I've been so thankful for the response uh, that Christine and I have received from people that have reached out to us to tell us about your one. Uh, last week, we talked about taking the lost world and instead of picturing it as this great, nebulous, gigantic thing, what we talked about was seeing it as individuals, realizing the fact that we all know lost people. We all know someone in our life that does not know Christ. And what we need to do is take some personal responsibility to stand up for the gospel's sake, to share the truth of God's word, uh, not because we want to, to, you know, to control them in some way. We're trying to set them free. We're trying to bring them to the realization of their lost condition and let them know of the beautiful gospel message, what God did for us one day. So we do, I thank you guys for all of you that reached out with your one. And I can promise you, we are praying diligently for them. And I even got a message even this morning from one of our members, one of our new members telling me about how God was working. Her one is her mom and how her mom, and who's, who's far away in another area, way far away from us, and yet God is working in her mother's heart. And the response she got today from a text that she'd sent her, you know, and her mom said, you know, I pray in Jesus name. And it's like, I mean, it's, it was, it is absolutely the hand of God. And someone who's seen the Lord work in people's lives miraculously across the country, around the world. Uh, I mean, all the way, I mean, thousand, six thousand miles away from being praying for somebody and them come to Christ. Uh, through God's hand. It's just absolutely incredible to experience. Let me just tell you this. Don't lose hope. If you're praying for your one, keep on praying. Give it to God. When we pray according to God's will for their lost soul, oh my goodness gracious, God is working. So thankful, thankful, thankful for all of you guys that reached out and let's diligently continue to pray for them. So as we talked about them and that what motivates us to share our faith, why did we uh, think about that one. Why were they so heavy on our heart is the motivation for us to share our faith is love. Okay. It's always, 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 always about love, loving their soul and also loving our savior that they might know him, the beautiful thing there. But so we looked at the motivation, but then we also looked at really the, the results, the catastrophic results of us not acting or of us keeping quiet and not sharing our faith, not fulfilling what God's called us to do. Because we realize the fact that the long term, yes, hell is the short term, but the long term is that catastrophic, horrific 
spiritual death in the lake of fire. That is what's approaching. So we realized this and we continued our discussion as we looked at the consequences of sin. And what it did was it also, we've got to, we've got to go back to that principle that we were discussing before, which is God's judgment. Now we know obviously that God is the ultimate example of a fair uh, and a just God. He is a fair and a just God. He, he is the ultimate example of that. There is, there's nothing in him that's unfair. Understand that God's motivation, he's fueled by love because it's his very nature. That's who God is. We know that God is love. And so stands to reason God is what we would call perfect love. It is a perfect love. So well, what's interesting is love and hate are two sides of the same coin. So with that understanding, if God is perfect love, that means at the same time that God is perfect hate. Okay, and we think of that and we go, whoa, man. We think about God and hate and we, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me just say this, man. God hates sin. You know, God hates sin. He loves righteousness and he hates sin. So what we have is the fact that you and I, we sometimes want to function in the gray area of our Christian lives. And what I want you to know is the fact that there with God, there is no gray area. God is black or white. God is right or wrong. There is no in between, okay? That in between is a creation of man to fit into what we want life or how we want to function with God. Matthew 6, 24 says this, no man can serve two masters, okay? For either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Listen to this last part. You cannot serve God and mammon. When you see the word mammon, what it's referencing is the world. Right? So God's saying you cannot serve God and the world simultaneously. It is impossible to do the right thing while simultaneously doing the wrong thing. That is an impossibility. But somehow in our ridiculous human reasoning, <laughs> we believe that we can. We believe that somehow... I can be living in sin, okay? Now, living in sin is, is, is living in direct disobedience to God, okay? If I know that I'm doing something wrong, I know that I'm in sin, I know I'm purposely choosing what I'm choosing, I am living in direct disobedience to God, okay? So it is impossible for me at the same time while I'm, while I'm living in direct disobedience to God to say that I am, in fact, living for God's glory, that I am, in fact, uh, following God. Now, if I'm following God, that means I'm going the path that the Lord takes, okay? So if I have chosen to follow my way and I'm not doing God's way, that means he says, look, obedience is this way. And I go, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, Lord, I'm going to follow you mostly, but part of the way is going to be me. Okay, if this is God's path and this is me directly behind him and all I do is change ever so slightly, guess what? We're going to go two different ways, aren't we? I'm no longer following God. I might be close to following him, but as I'm walking, I'm getting further and further away from him. But see, as Laodiceans, what happens is we live in this deceptive mindset that we believe that we can serve God, and yet we can serve ourselves at the same time, and you cannot do it. God says you cannot serve God and mammon. He says, I'm telling you, you cannot do it. Yet we tell ourselves that we can. And I'm just telling you, as someone, right, who lived much of their Christian life doing that very thing, believing I was serving God, but doing it my way, doing it my way. I was, in fact, living in disobedience while telling myself that I was being obedient. I'm living the good Christian life when in reality, I was living for mammon. I was living for my flesh, okay? So what we've got to realize is the fact that this is called deceiving ourselves, deceiving ourselves. We fool ourselves. 1 John 5 verses 8 through first, uh, 1 John 1 verses 5 through 8 says this. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Okay? No darkness at all. He's either light or dark. And we see that God is light, right? God is all light and there is no darkness. So there's no place for darkness. It is black or white, no gray. If we say, okay, listen to this. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, okay, 
We say, hey, man, I'm following God. I'm following God. I'm following God. Man, I'm right behind him, man. I'm all about Jesus. Yes, I am. But then what about this one part of my life? Well, you know, I mean, hey, nobody's perfect, right? If we say that we have no sin, we say I'm righteously following God, but we're not. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We're fooling ourselves. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God says, look, I'm waiting on you. You're fooling yourself. You're lying to yourself. You're trying to do it your way. It's not going to work. But when you come to the realization, when you finally understand it and you realize and you see that sin in your life and you honor it or you see it for what it is and you no longer honor that sin, you no longer worship that sin, but you turn from it, you repent from that sin. When you do, oh, hey, man, brother. Hey, man, listen, if we confess our sins, hey, God, you know what? I've been doing this my way. I've been doing it the wrong way the whole time. God, I've been serving myself. I've been serving my flesh. I've been telling myself that, you know what? I'm doing these godly things and I'm doing it for you. But in reality, I'm doing it to feed my own pride. God, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for me. But God, I see it now. You've re revealed it to me. The word of God has shown it to me. The, the mirror of the, the scripture has shown me the truth. And you know, I look at it now and I confess, right? I confess my sin. Boy, as soon as I confess it, man, I lay it out to the Lord. And I'm honest with him. What does he do? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says, man, I will use that life and I'll take all that yuck when you confess it to me. It'll be gone. And I'll use you as a righteous vessel. If verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Guys, God is either right or wrong black or white, gray does not work and it is impossible. If you're believing yourself right now to be serving God and you've got sin in your life that you're not dealing with and you're not convincing, then you've got to do it What do it God's way. You're fooling yourself. We must be honest with the Lord. 1 John 2, 6 and that next chapter says this, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. We will look like Christ. Guys, if we're going to claim our faith, it is absolutely essential that we live it. We don't claim it and talk about it, profess it, broadcast it, and not live it. Because I'm telling you, we do more damage that way than if we, than if we just live like the world. My goodness gracious, God has an expectation for us. He's trying to call us to righteousness, yet we want to live in the gray area. And God says, nah, -uh. you know, what does he see in, 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 uh, in Revelation 3? He says, you know what? You know, he said, because you're, you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm because you're lukewarm. I spew you out of my mouth. He says, I spit you out. He's talking to the Laodicean church. He's talking to us. He says, because you don't stand on the truth. You stand in between. You try to find ways to serve God in your flesh. You try to think to do to try to find ways to do God's will as well as accomplishing your own will at the same time. You got to realize they cancel each other out. You're either hot or you're cold. God says, "Look, I'd rather you just give up and you know what? Don't even say you're a Christian. Go and live like the world. Let make that be your reality. But if you're going to say you're a Christian, be on fire for me. Be hot for Christ, not halfway in and halfway out." We do so much more damage to the cause of Christ through our hypocrisy of living in the middle. We cannot be that way. We cannot live in the middle. There is no place for it. Because not only do we deceive ourselves in these situations when we deal with our own flesh, but we can also be deceived by others. Okay, And this is where we're going to shift into that aspect of those that are under religious deception. Those that have been fooled. Understand Satan is functioning right now and working in the Christian world all over this planet. Guess what? A false religions and all the same garbage that's in the United States. When we go to Africa, guess what? It's there. You go to India, it's there. No matter what part of the world you go to, those false religions have found their way in there and they are poisoning the truth of the gospel with another gospel. Second John 1.7 says this, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist, okay? They are they're all about Christ, but it's not the right, it's not the real Christ. 
okay? It's another Jesus. This is a deceiver. These are people that are running people away from God. They're using Jesus' name. Well, they're using the Bible, man. Oh, they'll pull out their Bible. They'll, they'll quote verses to you all day long, taken out of context. They'll take scripture and they will lay it out to you and make it a biblical case to you. But if you don't know what they're talking about because you don't know the word of God, they can easily deceive. So just because you're a child of God doesn't mean you can't be deceived. There are plenty of Christians out there that are in bad churches right now that are being taught false doctrine. And because of that, guess what? They're ineffective for the cause of Christ. And the work that we were called to do does not get accomplished because they're so busy, worried about details and stupid stuff that doesn't even relate to them. And they're believing falsehoods. Listen to the title that, you, that Paul gave them or Peter gave them in that or, or John gave them in this verse where he says, deceivers and antichrists. I want you to listen to what Paul says as he warns the church in Corinth. Listen to this. He's warning them. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 through 4, and then verses 12 and 15. For I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, okay, trickiness, his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The Bible is clear. The Bible is simple. The Bible is straightforward. The gospel message is simple and easy to follow. It is about the death, the death of Jesus, the payment for the sins of the world on the cross, his burial, right? And then the resurrection, the resurrection, that was the acceptance of God of the payment that was made. God accepted it. It's through that death, burial, and resurrection, the thing that we picture in baptism. It's the picture of the death, burial, and resurrection, the simple gospel. That's how you get saved. The Bible says it takes the faith of a child. It's simple. It's difficult in the fact that we have to submit our will to God's, and that's where our pride comes in. A humble man receives God. A prideful man stands in his own strength. So it says here, with the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse 4, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. Listen to this, another Jesus. He's using the same name. He's standing with his papal robes on. He's swinging his incense, and he's saying, Jesus, Jesus. Problem is, it isn't the Jesus of the Bible. It's the Jesus of a false religion. And it says here, uh, preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached. For if ye receive another spirit, can you hear this? So there's another Jesus and there's another spirit, which ye have not received or another gospel, okay? Another gospel that salvation is through the church, that salvation is through your baptism, that salvation is through your good works, another gospel, Okay, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and life and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's not another gospel. There is one gospel and only one truth that ye have not accepted. Ye might well bear with him. Verse 12, but what I do that I will do that I may cut off occasion. Okay, he says, look, I'm gonna step in. I'm gonna speak to these men. I'm gonna stop them from preaching the lies from them which desire occasion. These guys are taking, trying to take advantage of ye. He says, um, uh, of occasion that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. These men are doing it for their own fleshly purposes. They are trying to get gain for themselves. He says, look, I'm going to do my best to step in and stop them. Verse 13, because he's going to describe who they are right now. Listen to his description of who they are. For such are false apostles. False apostles. They say they're all about Jesus. Oh, I'm apostle this and I'm apostle that. And I'm a, I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a prophet. I'm prophetess. I'm whatever they are, whatever title they're going to give themselves, right? What happens here? He says, they are false apostles, apostles, deceitful workers. They work in lies. They function in deceit. Who's the father of liars? Yeah, we know who they're serving. They might use Jesus' name. They might wear a suit. They might carry a Bible. They might stand at your door and knock and be kind. They might be your next door neighbor and be one of the most gentle, righteous people that you know. But guess what? They are deceitful workers. And you know what? They've even deceived themselves. They're believing a lie that was manufactured by the enemy, transforming themselves. Listen to this. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They look just like Christians. They look like preachers. They look like pastors. They even sound like them, man. They use all the right words. Except for one or two will be slightly different. They'll, they'll follow and, and do all the things that they should do for God and that we should do. But there'll be a couple things that are ever so slightly different. Just ever so slightly changed. Verse 14. And no marvel... For Satan himself, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Boy, oh boy, does he look good. Man, every door that opens before you does not mean God opened it. Let me tell you that Satan opens plenty of doors, things that look good. 
And we need to search our hearts for the, for the, for the spirit of God to give us peace about decisions that we make in our life. We see things and go, man, the door just opened. It must be God's will. It must be God's will. But is it contrary to the word? If it's to, you know, if, if a husband and wife are, 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 are having troubles and an opportunity opens up for the husband to move away to another city and he says, you know what? This must be God's will because you know what? It seems like God wants me to be divorced. Well, guess what? God's will is never. He said, the Bible says, what God hath put together, let no man put asunder. Now, divorces happen, yes. Do people lose their marriages? Yes. But is it God's will? No. But we sometimes, man, we just get our way. We do things our way. Now, God can work through it. God can work through it. You know, someone can be divorced and get remarried, and God can use their life in a tremendous and amazing way. You know, God works all things together for good for those that love God that are called according to his purpose. But what I'm saying is God's will never, ever goes against his word. His will and his word always line up like the spirit always lines up with the word. So we see this and we understand the fact that, guess what? Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, man. He can look like an opportunity that looks like the greatest thing we've ever seen. Therefore, it is no great thing that if his, listen to this, no great thing if his ministers, his preachers, his prophetesses, his, his ministers of the gospel, another gospel, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Boy, they look just, they're just as godly as anybody I've ever met. Though, what a great person. Boy, she is such a blessing. She's incredible, so kind, so loving, and always has a positive word. But guess what? If they're not preaching the true gospel, it's a liar. That's how he shows up. Whose end shall be according to their works. But they will not escape that righteous judge because God sees right and wrong. He doesn't see the gray area, and these people function in a gray area, many of them deceiving their own selves. So he appears as an angel of light preaching another gospel. Galatians 1 verse 6 and 7 says this, and he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him. He says, look, how in the world, Galatians, what is wrong with you guys that you're so soon? Look, I just left there and you guys are already diverted off of Jesus that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He says, look, you guys are already believing false things. You should be standing on the truth, holding on to the word of God, holding on to what I've told you, what I've taught you, and let the spirit of God be your lead. Verse seven, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. Guys, this is a warning that Paul's writing to the first century church. Guys, if they were false apostles, false apostles back then that are trying to pervert the gospel of the truth, man, there are way more of them today. And unfortunately, I'd like to say that most churches are good, godly churches that are following the Bible. But I'm just telling you, I wish that was true, but it's not the truth. I praise God for the Living Faith Fellowship and all the churches that we've met around the country that are honoring and glorifying God the proper way and sticking to the word of God. It's so important that we do this. But guys, you and I individually must take responsibility to stand upon the truth and make sure that we understand who God is. Because the word pervert, what that means is to corrupt or distort, to twist, right? And the devil spends the majority of his time not in places of ill repute. He's not in casinos. He's, he's not in beer halls. That's not where he spends his time. Those people are already lost. He spends his time in churches. He spends his time around Christian people trying to portray himself as a Christian and then just introducing a few things that will cause confusion because understand that's where he functions. He twists the word of God and changes it ever so slightly to confuse it and distort it. And we know that God is not the author of confusion, right? That's something that we know. But see, whether it's a, a Jehovah's Witness who denies that Jesus Christ is God, and that's exactly what they do. They may use Jesus all day long, but when it comes down to it, he's not God, not to them. It may be the Church of Christ, right, that takes salvation. Oh, man, it's all about Jesus, but you better make sure you're baptized, because if you're not baptized, you're not lost. A distortion of the scripture, a message written in Acts 2.38 to the Jewish people, and they use it for the church, a distortion. If it's a Catholic, a Catholic who believes their salvation is through the church, and people go, oh, that's not true, they don't believe that. Go read the, the, the Catholic doctrines. Go to their website, that's what it says. Salvation is through the church. That's another gospel. The gospel message is Jesus through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But if it's through another, another gospel, it's through the church. It's not through universal Christianity. It's through Jesus and Jesus alone. Or if it's Calvinist, a Calvinist who basically intellectualizes the same general principles of Catholicism and just packages them a little bit more smoothly. But in the end, it's the same lie. It's all about resting the scriptures, twisting the scriptures, changing the gospel message. 
Now, every one of these and plenty of others that exist take the simplicity of the gospel and they, they are either add to it or they take away from it, okay? They either add to it or they take away from it. Revelations 22, verses 18 and 19 says this, For I testify unto you, unto I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. This is talking about the book of Revelation, talking about the entire Bible. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city from the beginnings, from the things which are written in this book. See, God gave us his word in a book called the Bible so that we could have the ultimate guide for faith and practice. And if it's not that guide for you, then how in the world could we be a true believer and a true follower of Christ? If this is, if the Bible is your guide, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If this is what makes you, helps you make your decisions and this is the guide of your life, then praise God. Because there are countless people that will end up in the lake of fire who carried a Bible and went to a church and professed Jesus and thought, you know what? My life's all about him. But they believed a lie. They believed a lie. And the subtlety of Satan poisoned the truth. And where their salvation which is all Jesus, right? If it's 100% Jesus, you're good, man. You trust that Jesus is the only way. But if it's 99% Jesus and 1% your works, it's not all Jesus. It's not following the way. I am the way and the truth and life. No man come to the Father but by me. There is no add. There is no subtract. It's by him and him alone. If it's through your baptism and Jesus, it's not by Jesus. If it's by your membership in the church, it's not by Christ. If it's through the things that you do, the, the, the person that you are, the lineage that you live, whatever it is, your child, your infant baptism, whatever it is, that's not salvation through Christ. That's not the simplicity of the gospel. Realize the fact that God has shown us the truth. If someone chooses to believe a lie, it is just that it is a choice. If we want the truth, we can have it. 1 Corinthians 2.10 says this, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. If we want to know the truth, God will show us the truth. And what this means is this. If we'll come to God with a, with a humble heart and we'll seek the truth of God's word, he'll give it to us. If we want to know if what we're believing is true or not, ask God to reveal the truth. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this. He says, and ye shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Now he's writing, obviously, to the Israelites back then. He's talking to them about, the, about their land. But that promise right there is for anyone. It's the, the principle is true for anybody. We're created by God. If you're a born again child of God, then he is your father. So as we use that concept right there, jumping off with this Old Testament truth, Jesus is going to give us a great example of God's heart toward humanity, okay? So we look at that Jeremiah and we go, okay, now that's Old Testament reference to the Israelites, but look at where Jesus takes that same principle and he applies it into now, into the church age. Listen to this in Luke 9, verses, verses 11, verses 9 through 13. And I say unto you, listen to this, and I say unto you, and it shall be given, he says, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given unto you, seek, and ye shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? He says, look, if he asks for bread, is he going to give him a piece of, a piece of stone? Or if he asks a fish, uh, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, evil, being evil, he says, look, you that are carnal, he says, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? God's saying, look, you know what? If you know how to take care of your children, don't you think I know how to do a much better job than you could ever dream? And see, here's a testimony of that truth, right? Christine's prayer, when we were lost, right? She was reading the word of God. She borrowed it from Anne Marie, as I talked about last week as I shared our story. And what was so interesting was the fact that what Christine's desire was, she was asking God and her prayer as a lost person was God, just show me the truth. Show me the truth. 
I want to know the truth. A ch- she wanted to know what salvation was. What's this life about? What's the purpose, right? People want to have the answers to life. And guess what? The first place they have to start is with salvation. We've got to know who Jesus is. And see, God answered that prayer. He answered the prayers of Anne Marie and Anne Tony because they had a desire. They were desiring and praying for our souls. And when she prayed and said, God, you know what? Just show me the truth. Jesus tells us that the truth, right? In John 8, 32, he says, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The truth, not a twisting, not a distortion, not a half truth, not a 90% truth. Truth is no false, no falsehood. There's no deception. It's just truth. And see, this is the kind of prayer that God responds to. If a lost person is seeking God and they're saying, show me the truth of who you are, God, reveal yourself to me. God's desire is that they know him. He wants them to see who he is, right? John 8, 36, it says, if the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free in Indeed, ye shall be free in deed. You see, but sadly, there are so many people who will not earnestly seek the truth. They're not looking to do things God's way. And see what happens, because we want God to fit into our life. We want God to fit into what we want. We want, as long as it's convenient for our lifestyle... I'm looking for really the Jesus that kind of fits me. Not that I want to change me to be more like him. I want to maybe make him fit more me. So what I'll do is I'll shop around to find a church that fits kind of my lifestyle. I'll find something and find a version of the Bible that fits fits the way that I want to be. Why do you think there's so many different versions out there to customize and fit to make people feel more comfortable? The gospel is not comfortable. Coming to God is not comfortable. Now, the result is incredibly comfortable. It's incredibly fulfilling and wonderful and joyous. Praise God. But the process of getting there to deny oneself and to take up one's cross and to realize the fact that we're supposed to give up ourself, we're supposed to submit ourselves, therefore, to God and resist the devil. And guess what? Satan will run away from us, but God will receive us, man. If we will come to him, and as we talked about before, man, we'll come before him, and we will, we will earnestly pour our hearts out to God. He says, man, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. He's faithful and just. But see, if we're looking for a lie, God will allow us to have a lie. See, because people want to lie, God will truly let them have it. Listen to this in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 12. And we're going to have to wrap up because I know time's getting tight. And it says, verse, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 12. And with all deceivableness of, right, of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, okay? They were given the truth, but they would not receive it, that they might be saved. And for this cause, now they were offered the truth, okay? They had an opportunity between a lie and they had an opportunity between the truth, okay? They were told what it would mean. They would, the unrighteous in them that perish, okay? It says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, these are people that are lost, people that are on their way to hell, because they receive not the love of the truth, they choose to say, you know what? I see truth and I see a lie. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to choose the lie. That fits me better. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They chose poorly. It's like the old Indiana Jones. uh, Mark Trotter posted something the other day, and it was picture from from the Indian Jones, the Last Crusade, and there's the old knight that's standing there, and they're taking the, he got the two grail cups, right? And he says, you know what? Choose wisely. He said, one, one cup is unto death, and one cup is unto life. He says, choose, but choose wisely. Those that choose unwisely, guess what? Death is what they are going to face. Whether or not they have something, it looks, and see, the problem is in that movie, that one chalice, it looked all beautiful, gold and shiny and gorgeous. He said, oh, that must be the cup of Christ. It looks like the one that a king would drink from. But you remember, Jesus came as a man. He came as a servant. The cup was dirty and old, right? Now, obviously, that's not biblical. But what happens here is it's a picture there. And it shows us that I get bottom line is, you know what? People want it to fit what they want. God says, no, no, no. You need to adapt your life to what I want, to what I want. They will live with the results of their choices. They're going to face it. Second Peter 3, verses 
3 through 18, and we're going to have to wrap up with this. I believe we don't think we're getting much further. 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 18. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, okay? This is the last days. As we're in right now, we are in the last days walking after their own lusts, okay? This is the people today, okay? This is, this is folks in the world and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Okay, you've been saying Jesus is coming all this time. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Look, nothing's changed. You keep saying Jesus is coming, but hey, guess what? Time's still rolling on. What's the big deal? For this, they will willingly, this list, for this, they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Okay, this is, there's a much deeper message we'll get into another time. This is actually talking about uh, the two floods upon the earth. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved. Let's understand, there's no more floods anymore. Understand this. Now the world is going to be reserved. Listen, by the word, uh, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. This is what's coming. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years as is one day. Talking about that millennial reign that is to come. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. As, as promised, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's claiming the truth, proclaiming the truth, using God's people to proclaim the truth. That's our job. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. This earth is going to be wiped out. What manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Knowing that this is what's coming, why are we wasting our time living like the world? We don't know when he's going to come. As a thief in the night, he can arrive. How do you want to be found with God? Serving him or serving ourselves, right? What do we want to be? Verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. He says, live for me. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, we as also... In all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, he says, look, Paul was always pointing to the second coming. We all are, we're all pointing to the second coming. Jesus is going to return. He's going to return. Don't listen to the scoffers. Live your life for him. You don't know when the last day is, in which are some things hard to understand. He says, look, hey, I've read Paul's stuff. And what's happening, Peter's saying, hey, you know what? Even I have a hard time understanding. Sometimes it's hard to follow. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, Okay. Pointing to those people that don't follow the word of God. They don't allow the spirit of God to lead them. They allow their flesh to lead them. They fall. They false prophets, false teachers. It says here, they that are unlearned, they're not following the spirit. The spirit of God is supposed to lead us and teach us. And he says, and they are, and says, and are unstable. They rest. That W-R-E-S-T, rest, means it's the root word of wrestle. They twist the scripture as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. They will face God. The problem is that they're taking so many people, innocent people with them because they're believing these lies. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the terror, with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. So not only are the lost being led astray, but he's saying, hey, look, be careful. Be careful, Christians, that you not fall into this being led away with the error of the wicked and fall from your own steadfastness. God has called us to a work. He's called us to a life of holiness and we lose sight of that and we follow the lies of men and women who teach false gospels and twist the scripture of this holy book and use it as a weapon of destruction because their ruler, their father, wants people to go to hell. God has given us the truth. We have to be willing to share it and know it. That's why we spend so much time trying to teach you the word of God. Let it change your heart. Let it adapt you. Let it grow you. Let it transform you. Don't listen to these messages for someone else. 
Let's listen to him for ourselves. Let's let the scripture speak to our hearts, not so that we gain knowledge so we can teach someone else. This is for us. We need to hear. As Jesus said, ears to hear. Let them hear. I pray that we hear tonight and that we realize the fact that, you know what? This world is full of people, religious and completely lost, that need the same gospel, the simple truth of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. I love you guys. Let's be soldiers for the cross. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for giving us this time. Thank you for the message. Thank you, Lord God, for uh, just really the call to action that you've placed in uh, on my heart, God, and you've certainly shown us in the scriptures tonight. I pray that you help us to keep our eyes open for those that are deceivers, Lord. Help them to help us to see them for what they are. Realize the fact that they are not Christians. They are not representing you, Lord. They are representing a false gospel. So, Lord, help us not only to recognize them, but, Lord, help us to steer them to the truth because they're lost souls, just like those that are out in the world that are living, uh, Lord, for their flesh. These people are believing a religious lie, and they're heading straight to hell, not knowing that they don't know Christ. God, help them, Father, to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Help us, Lord, to have uh, the willingness to speak truth. Thank you for this time. I pray that you'll use us for your glory this coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. I love you. See you next week.